But to proceed, Nias Octavius, who was joined in command with Aemilius, came to an anchor with his fleet under Samothrace, where, out of respect to the gods, he permitted Perseus to enjoy the benefit of refuge, but took care that he should not escape by sea. Notwithstanding, Perseus secretly persuaded Orandes of Crete, master of a small vessel, to convey him and his treasure away. He, however, playing the true Cretan, took in the treasure and bade him come in the night with his children in most necessary attendance to the port by the temple of Ceres. But as soon as it was evening, set sail without him. It had been sad enough for Perseus to be forced to let down himself, his wife and children through a narrow window by wall, people altogether unaccustomed to hardship and flying. But that which drew a far sadder sigh from his heart was, when he was told by a man, as he wandered on the shore, and that he had seen Arandes under sail in the main sea, it being now about daybreak. So, there being no hopes left of escaping, he fled back again to the wall, which he and his wife recovered, and though they were seen by the Romans before they could reach them. His children he himself had delivered into the hands of Ion, one that had been his favorite, but now proved his betrayer, and was the chief cause that forced him, and beasts themselves will do so when their young ones are taken, to come and yield himself up to those that had them in their power. His greatest confidence was in Nausicaa, and it was for him he called, but he not being there, he bewailed his misfortune and, seeing there was no possible remedy, surrendered himself to Octavius. And here, in particular, he made it manifest that he was possessed with a vice more sordid than covetousness itself, namely, the fondness of life, by which he deprived himself even of pity, the only thing that fortune never takes away from the most wretched. He desired to be brought to Aemilius, who arose from his seat, and accompanied with his friends, went to receive him, with tears in his eyes, as a great man fallen by the anger of the gods and his own ill fortune. When Perseus, of the most shameful of sights, threw himself at his feet, embraced his knees, and uttered unmanly cries and petitions, such as Aemilius was not able to bear, nor would vouchsafe safe to hear. But looking on him with a sad and angry countenance, he said, Why, unhappy man, do you thus take pains to exonerate fortune of your heaviest charge against her, by conduct that will make it seem that you are not unjustly in calamity, and that it is not your present condition, but your former happiness that was more than your deserts? And why depreciate also my victory, and make my conquest insignificant by proving yourself a coward and a foe beneath a Roman? Distressed valor challenges great respect, even from enemies. But cowardice, though never so successful, from the Romans has always met with scorn. Yet for all this he took him up, and gave him his hand, and delivered him into the custody of Tubero. Meantime he himself carried his sons, his sons-in-law, and others of chief rank, especially of the younger sort, and back with him into his tent, where for a long time he sat down without speaking one word, insomuch that they all wondered at him. At last he began to discourse of fortune and human affairs. Is it meet, said he, for him that knows he is but man in his greatest prosperity to pride himself, and be exalted at the conquest of a city, nation, or kingdom, not rather well to weigh this change of fortune, in which all warriors may see an example of their common frailty, and learn a lesson that there is nothing durable or constant. For what time can men select to think themselves secure, when that a victory itself forces us more than any to dread our own fortune, and a very little consideration on the law of things, and how all are hurried around, 
and each man's station changed, will introduce sadness in the midst of the greatest joy. Nor can you, when you see before your eyes the succession of Alexander himself, who arrived at the height of power and ruled the greatest empire, in the short space of an hour trodden underfoot. When you behold a king, that was but even now surrounded with so numerous an army, receiving nourishment to support his life from the hands of his conquerors. Can you, I say, believe there is any certainty in what we now possess whilst there is such a thing as chance? No, young man, cast off that vain pride and empty burst of victory. Sit down with humility, looking always for what is yet to come, and the possible future reverses which the divine displeasure may eventually make the end of our present happiness. It is said that Aemilius, having spoken much more to the same purpose, dismissed the young men properly humbled, and with their vain glory and insolence thoroughly chastened and curbed by this address. When this was done, he put his army into garrisons, to refresh themselves and went himself to visit Greece and to spend a short time in relaxations equally honorable and humane. For as he passed, he eased the people's grievances, reformed their government, and bestowed gifts upon them. To some corn, to others oil out of the king's storehouses, in which they were poured. There were such vast quantities laid up that receivers and petitioners were lacking before they could be exhausted. In Delphi he found a great square pillar of white marble, designed for the pedestal of King Perseus's golden statue, on which he commanded his own to be placed, alleging that it was but just that the conquered should give place to the conquerors. In Olympia he is said to have uttered the saying everybody has heard, and that Phidias had carved Homer's Jupiter. When the ten commissioners arrived from Rome, he delivered up again to the Macedonians their cities and country, granting them to live at liberty, and according to their own laws, only paying the Romans the tribute of a hundred talents, and double which sum they had been wont to pay to their kings. And then he celebrated all manner of shows and games, and sacrifices to the gods, and made great entertainments and feasts. And the charge of all which he liberally defrayed out of the king's treasury, and showed that he understood the ordering and placing of his guests, and how every man should be received, answerably to their rank and quality, with such nice exactness and that the Greeks were full of wonder, finding the care of these matters of pleasure did not escape him, and that though involved in such important business, he could observe correctness in these trifles. Nor was it least gratifying to him that amidst all the magnificent and splendid preparations, he himself was always the most grateful sight, and greatest pleasure to those he entertained and he told those that seemed to wonder at his diligence, and that there was the same spirit shown in marshalling a banquet as an army, in rendering that one formidable to the enemy, and the other acceptable to the guests. Nor did men less praise his liberality and the greatness of his soul and than his other virtues, for he would not so much as see those great quantities of silver and gold which were heaped together out of the king's palaces, but delivered them to the quaestors to be put into the public treasury. He only permitted his own sons, who were great lovers of learning, to take the king's books, and when he distributed rewards due to extraordinary valor, he gave his son-in-law, Aelius Tubero, a bowl that weighed five pounds. And this is that Tubero we have already mentioned, who was one of sixteen relations that lived together, and were all maintained out of one little farm. And it is said that this was the first plate that ever entered the house of Ali, and brought thither as an honor and reward of virtue. Before this time, 
and neither they nor their wives are permitted to use of either silver or gold. Having thus settled everything well, taking his leave of the Greeks and exhorting the Macedonians that mindful of the liberty they had received from the Romans, and they should endeavor to maintain it by their obedience to the laws and concord amongst themselves, he departed for Pyrrhus, having orders from the Senate to give the soldiers that followed him in the war against Perseus and the pillage of the cities of that country. And that he might set upon them all at once by surprise and unawares, he summoned ten of the principal men out of each, whom he commanded, on such an appointed day, to bring all the gold and silver they had either in their private houses or temples, and, with every one of these, as if it were for this very purpose, and under a pretense of searching for and receiving the gold, he sent a centurion and a guard of soldiers, who, the set day being come, rose all at once, and at the very selfsame time fell upon them, and proceeded to ransack the cities, so that in one hour a hundred and fifty thousand persons were made slaves, and threescore and ten cities sacked. Yet what was given to each soldier, out of so vast a destruction and utter ruin, amounted to no more than eleven drachmas, so that men could only shudder at the issue of a war, where the wealth of a whole nation thus divided turned to so little advantage and profit to each particular man. When Aemilius had done this, an action perfectly contrary to his gentle and mild nature, he went down to Oricus, where he embarked his army for Italy. He sailed up the river Tiber in the king's galley, that had sixteen banks of oars, and was richly adorned with captured arms and claws of purple and scarlet, so that, the vessel rowing slowly against the stream, the Romans that crowded on the shore to meet him had a foretaste of his following triumph. But the soldiers, who had cast a covetous eye on the treasures of Perseus, when they did not obtain as much as they thought they deserved, were secretly enraged and angry with Aemilius for this, but openly complained that he had been a severe and tyrannical commander over them. Nor were they ready to show the desire of his triumph. When Servius Galba, who was Aemilius' enemy, and though he commanded his tribune under him, understood this, he had the boldness plainly to affirm that a triumph was not to be allowed him, and sowed various calumnies amongst the soldiers, which had further increased their ill will. Nay, more, he desired the tribunes of the people, and because the four hours that were remaining of the day could not suffice for the accusation, to let him put it off till another. But when the tribunes commanded him to speak then, if he had anything to say, he began a long oration, filled with all manner of reproaches, in which he spent the remaining part of the time, and the tribunes, when it was dark, dismissed the assembly. The soldiers, growing more vehement on this, thronged all to Galba, and entering into a conspiracy, early in the morning beset the capital, where the tribunes had appointed the following assembly to be held. As soon as it was day, it was put to the vote, and the first tribe was proceeding to refuse the triumph, and the news spread amongst the people and to the senate. And the people were indeed much grieved that Aemilius should meet with such ignominy, but this was only in words, which had no effect. And the chief of the senate exclaimed against it as a base action, and excited one another to repress the boldness and insolence of the soldiers, which would ere long become altogether ungovernable and violent, were they now permitted to deprive Aemilius of his triumph. Forcing a passage through the crowd, they came up in great numbers, and desired the tribunes to defer polling till they had spoken what they had to say to the people. All things thus suspended, and silence being made, Marcus Suilius stood up, a man of consular dignity, and who had killed twenty-three of his enemies that had challenged him in single combat. It is now more than ever, said he, 
clear to my mind how great a commander our Aemilius Paulus is. When I see he was able to perform such famous and great exploits with an army so full of sedition and baseness, nor can I sufficiently wonder that a people that seem to glory in the triumphs over Illyrians and Ligurians should now, through envy, refuse to see the Macedonian king that alive, and all the glory of Philip and Alexander in captivity to the Roman power. For is it not a strange thing for you, who upon a slight rumor of victory that came by chance into the city, and did offer sacrifices, and put up your requests unto the gods that you might see the report verified. Now, when the generals returned with an undoubted conquest, to defraud the gods of honor, and yourselves of joy, as if you feared to behold the greatness of his warlike deed, or were resolved to spare your enemy. And of the two, much better were it to put a stop to the triumph of pity to him than out of envy to your general. Yet to such a height of power as malice arrived amongst you, and that a man without one scar to show on his skin, and that is smooth and sleek with ease and home-keeping habits, will undertake to define the office and duties of a general before us, who with our own wounds have been taught how to judge of the valor or the cowardice of commanders. And, at the same time, putting aside his garment, he showed an infinite number of scars upon his breast, and, turning about, he exposed some parts of his person which it is usual to conceal, and, addressing Galpa, said, You deride me for these, in which I glory before my fellow citizens, for it is in their service in which I have ridden night and day, and that I receive them. But go collect the votes, whilst I follow after, and note the base and ungrateful, and such as choose rather to be flattered and courted than commanded by their general. It is said this speech so stopped the soldiers' mouths, and altered their minds, and that all the tribes decreed a triumph for Emilius, which was performed after this manner. And the people erected scaffolds in the forum, in the circuses, as they call their buildings for horse races, and in all other parts of the city where they could best behold the show. And the spectators were clad in white garments, all the temples were open and full of garlands and perfumes. The ways were cleared and kept open by numerous officers, who drove back all who crowded into or ran across the main avenue. And this triumph lasted three days. On the first, which was scarcely long enough for the sight, were to be seen the statues, pictures, and colossal images which were taken from the enemy, and drawn upon two hundred and fifty chariots. On the second was carried a great many wagons, the finest and richest armor of the Macedonians, both of brass and steel, all newly polished and glittering the pieces of which were piled up and arranged purposely with the greatest art, so as to seem to be tumbled in heaps carelessly and by chance. Helmets were thrown upon shields, coats of mail upon greaves, cretin targets, and Thracian bucklers and quivers of arrows lay huddled amongst horses' bits. And through these there appeared the points of naked swords, intermixed with milong Macedonian sarasas. All these arms were fastened together with just so much looseness that they struck against one another as they were drawn along, and made a harsh and alarming noise, so that, even as spoils of a conquered enemy, they could not be beheld without dread. After these wagons loaded with armor, there followed three thousand men who carried the silver that was coined, in seven hundred and fifty vessels, each of which weighed three talents, and was carried by four men. Others brought silver bowls and goblets and cups, all disposed in such order as to make the best show, and all curious as well for their size as the solidity of their embossed work. On the third day, early in the morning, first came the trumpeters, who did not sound as they were wont in a procession of solemn entry, but such a charge as the Romans used when they encouraged the soldiers to fight. 
Next followed young men wearing frocks with ornamented borders, who led to the sacrifice a hundred and twenty stalled oxen, with their horns gilded, and their heads adorned with ribbons and garlands. And with these were boys that carried basins for libation, of silver and gold. After this was brought the gold coin, which was divided into vessels that weighed three talents, like those that contained the silver. And they were in number seventy-seven. These were followed by those that brought the consecrated bowl which Aemilius had caused to be made, and that weighed ten talents, and was set with precious stones. And then were exposed to view the cups of Antigonus and Seleucus, and those of the Thuraclean make, and all the gold plate that was used at Perseus's table. Next to these came Perseus's chariot, in which his armor was placed, and on that his diadem. And, after a little intermission, the king's children were led captives, and with them a train of their attendants, masters, and teachers, all shedding tears, and stretching out hands to the spectators, and making the children themselves also beg and entreat their compassion. And there were two sons and a daughter, whose tender age made them but little sensible of the greatness of their misery, which very insensibility of their condition rendered it the more deplorable, insomuch that Perseus himself was scarcely regarded as he went along, whilst pity fixed the eyes of the Romans upon the infants. And many of them could not forbear tears, and all beheld the sight with a mixture of sorrow and pleasure, until the children were past. After his children and their attendants came Perseus himself, clad all in black, and wearing the boots of his country, and looking alike one altogether stunned and deprived of reason through the greatness of his misfortunes. Next followed a great company of his friends and familiars, whose countenances were disfigured with grief, and who let the spectators see by their tears and their continual looking upon Perseus, and that it was his fortune they so much lamented, and that they were regardless of their own. Perseus sent to Aemilius to entreat that he might not be led in pomp, but be left out of the triumph, who, deriding, as was but just, his cowardice and fondness of life sent him this answer, that as for that, it had been before and was now in his own power, giving him to understand that the disgrace could be avoided by death, which the faint-hearted man not having the spirit for, and made effeminate by I know not what hopes, allowed himself to appear as a part of his own spoils. After these were carried four hundred crowns, all made of gold, sent from the cities by their respective deputations to Aemilius in honor of his victory, and then he himself came, seated on a chariot magnificently adorned, a man well worthy to be looked at, even without these ensigns of power, dressed in a robe of purple, interwoven with gold, and holding a laurel branch in his right hand. All the army, in like manner, with bows of laurel in their hands, divided into their hands and companies, followed the chariot by their commander some singing verses, according to the usual custom, mingled with raillery, others songs of triumph and the praise of Aemilius's deeds, who, indeed, was admired and accounted happy by all men, and unenvied by every one that was good, except so far as it seems the province of some god to lessen that happiness, which is too great and inordinate, and so to mingle the affairs of human life that no one should be entirely free and exempt from calamities. But, as we read in Homer, that those should think themselves truly blessed whom fortune has given an equal share of good and evil. Aemilius had four sons, of whom Scipio and Fabius, as is already related, were adopted into other families. The other two, whom he had by a second wife, and who were yet but young, he brought up in his own house. One of these died at fourteen years of age, five days before his father's triumph, and the other at twelve, three days after. 
so that there was no Roman without a deep sense of his suffering, and who did not shudder at the cruelty of fortune, and that had not scrupled to bring so much sorrow into a house replenished with happiness, rejoicing, and sacrifices, and to intermingle tears and lament with songs of victory and triumph. Aemilius, however, reasoning justly that courage and resolution was not merely to resist armor and spears, but all the shocks of ill fortune, so met and so adapted himself to these mingled and contrasting circumstances as to outbalance the evil with the good, and his private concerns with those of the public. And thus did not allow anything either to take away from the grandeur or sully the dignity of his victory. For as soon as he had buried the first of his sons, as we have already said, he triumphed, and the second dying almost as soon as his triumph was over, he gathered together an assembly of the people, and made an oration to them, not like a man that stood in need of comfort from others, but one that undertook to support his fellow citizens in their grief for the sufferings he himself underwent. I, he said, who never yet feared anything that was human have among such as were divine, always had a dread of fortune as faithless and inconstant. And, for the very reason that in this war she had been as a favorable gale in all my affairs, I still expected some change in reflux of things. In one day, I passed the Ionian Sea, and reached Corsara from Brindisium. And thence in five more I sacrificed at Delphi, and in another five days came to my forces in Macedonia, where, after I had finished the usual sacrifices for the purifying of the army, I entered on my duties, and in space of fifteen days put an honorable period to the war. Still retaining a jealousy of fortune, even from the smooth current of my affairs, and seeing myself secure and free from the danger of any enemy, I chiefly dreaded the change of the goddess at sea, whilst conveying home my victorious army, vast spoils, and a captive king. Nay, indeed, after I was returned to you safe, and saw the city full of joy, congratulating and sacrifices, yet still I distrusted, well knowing that fortune never conferred any great benefits that were unmixed and unattended with probabilities of reverse. Nor could my mind, that was still as it were in labor, and always foreseeing something to befall this city, free itself from this fear, until this great misfortune befell me in my own family, until, in the midst of those days set apart for triumph, I carried two of the best sons, my only destined successors, one after another to their funerals. Now, therefore, I myself am safe from danger, at least as to what was my greatest care, and I trust and am verily persuaded that for the time to come fortune will prove constant and harmless unto you. Since she has sufficiently wreaked her jealousy at our great success on me and mine, and has made the conqueror as marked an example of human instability as a captive whom he led in triumph with this only indifference, that Perseus, though conquered, does yet enjoy his children, while the conqueror, Aemilius, is deprived of his. This was the general and magnanimous oration Aemilius is said to have spoken to the people, from a 